In this video I want to introduce how to program a microcontroller using devices other than the trainer kits that we've been working with this semester. There are a couple options. You can either program your microcontroller in the circuit that it's already residing in. This has been the case all semester in our trainer kits. We've just left the pick where it is and we've programmed it when we've needed it to be programmed. We've left it attached to devices like the speaker and the LCD and seven segment displays and all those things. You also have an option to do out of circuit programming. This is largely how microcontrollers were programmed years ago, but the in circuit programming has largely replaced out of circuit. But there are some benefits to both methods that we'll talk about. And I want to illustrate different ways that you can do different types of programming. So when I first started learning to use PIC microcontrollers, this was the technology at the time. I used what was called the PIC Start Plus. And they still make these. Um, they have an old DB9 serial connection on them, which you can actually get a converter and convert it over to USB. And this is what's called a ZIF socket, zero insertion force. So you can just take your PIC out, make sure pin one is uh, dropped right up here at the top slot, and put it down in. It doesn't take any force just to drop your pick in and then this little lever pulls down to lock the pick into place. This does require an external power component so you generally have a little uh, power supply brick that has to be attached to it and you have programming software that can actually just write directly to the microcontroller. This was the technology that was largely used around the mid 1990s and has been updated. Here's a slightly newer version of an out of circuit programmer. This is from Canada, so it's called the Canna Kit. And it actually has two different ZIF sockets. So if you have a smaller pick, you can put it in a smaller socket. If you have a big pick like the one we've been using this semester, you can actually put it in there. The nice thing about this is it's designed to work off of USB, so you don't have to provide uh, a converter from the old serial connection to USB and also it does actually draw the power from the USB so you don't need that second cable and second power adapter. So this is a little bit more portable solution but still a little bit cumbersome. In terms of in-circuit programmers the microchip company if you're working with PIC devices has what's called the PIC kit. This happens to be the PIC kit 3 which I think is the newest version and what you see here is you have a few wires down or a few connectors that you can put some wires to down here on the bottom and it will connect those six pins to particular locations on the PIC and we'll talk about that soon and so what you're going to do is effectively send data into the PIC on select pins. So here are what those six pins are connected to. So in this case, you connect to your VPP, your master clear there. So that's generally where we have had our uh, red button. So that's your reset there, or sorry, our blue button on the trainer kit. And then you've got the VDD and VSS of the PIC. So you supply this to your power and your ground. And then you've got a data line and a clock line. So it's using serial communication to actually connect there. And then I think the pin 6 is actually for low voltage programming. So if you are programming in a low voltage mode, which some picks are designed to do, then you can use that pin 6 connector. On our PIC 16F887, I've highlighted the six pins that you would connect to. So you've got your master clear up on pin 1. You can connect to VDD and VSS on 11 and 12. I'm sure you could also do that on 31 and 32 if you like. Um, I just happen to highlight 11 and 12 there. And then your data and your clock for programming are on pins 39 and 40 up there. And what you can see is that happens to coincide with RB7 and RB6. And also your PGM is where that low voltage programming pin gets connected to. And so if you notice, if you're not careful, you could have a conflict with devices on port B. So it's a good practice if you're using one of these in-circuit programmers such as the PIC Kit 2 or PIC Kit 3 to actually disconnect whatever happens to be attached to your RB6, RB7, and RB3 pins so you don't have any interference with those devices. Oftentimes this is accomplished by using a special jumper setting so when you're programming you just automatically disconnect 
Our trainer kit handles this automatically for us, so we haven't had to worry about that. But if you were to develop an embedded systems project and you wanted to use the PIT kit 3 to program, you would need to make sure that you do disconnect those pins as appropriate. So there are some benefits to using an in-circuit programmer. It's nice because all you have to do is really disconnect those three pins of port B. You can leave everything as it is in your circuit, but if you're not careful about it, you can have some conflict on those pins. The out-of-circuit programmer is nice because you know there's not going to be any interference with any external peripherals, and so it avoids some conflicts on those other pins. The problem is it's sometimes tedious to pull the pick out, and so you can actually bend the pins of the pick. Sometimes it's tough to insert it back in, so it, it's nice if you can leave the, the pick exactly where it is and just program it. That's going to lead to better wear and tear on your pins, but if you do want the out-of-circuit programmer or that's just what you have available, just be prepared to get a special device. They do make dip pullers like we've used in the lab and other uh, devices for pulling picks and other uh, dual inline package devices out of um, the circuit so you can actually put them into these programmers.